We don't hit home runs on this podcast. We work station to station. We're back after a little mid-season break. <laughs> Talk some more Blue Jays. Uh, Dustin, of course, is alongside. And we also have Quentin, West End represent. Gentlemen, I think uh, we actually have a few things to talk about today. We don't have the, the usual dire discussion of how much the Blue Jays suck this year. Dustin, we usually talk, we usually do like, how are we feeling? But uh, I think everyone is on the same page here. So let's, let's jump right in. Uh, Bowden Francis, this guy's on a roll. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a little bit, I guess, surprised like almost everybody else at how good he is. I think the last two, is it the last two starts? He's kind of had a no hit bid, um, at least into the sixth, one into the eighth and one into the, was it, was it the eighth both times? Twice in the ninth or once into the sixth. Well, right. Okay. Last four starts. Last four starts have been, yeah, last four starts have been awesome. And yeah, like, which is incredible. Uh, but, you know, he got really close to the no hit two times, uh, well, two and a half times, I guess you can count. I don't know whether or not to believe it. I mean, you know, these guys kind of have some good runs for a little while. And so we'll see, but it's been going for quite a while. And so, you know, he's starting to make me believe and, um, which is great because, um, uh, with trading Kikuchi, you know, we, we're going to need somebody to sort of hold down that three, four spot. Um, uh, and if he can do it, then that just makes the off season that much easier. We don't have to look for another, uh, starter. It was, it was, it was incredible. Like it's, it's, I think it's his last four starts twice. He went to the ninth inning, two outs, uh, with the, the no hitter and once into the sixth inning. So to, to do that, like how many guys can say that? Or like he was, he's in the class of, uh, two Blue Jays now who've taken a no hitter into the ninth inning, I believe. Dave Steve. And that's, that's it. A few, few others have done it into the ninth. Um, Halliday once, I believe. And, uh, was it Dustin McGowan? Brandon Morrow, so it's it's not a long list. Like that's a that's some good company to be in. That's yeah, sure. I, I can only imagine like the atmosphere yesterday. Like it's like it's never been done at home, right? Like we've had one no hitter and that was on the road, so it's never been done at home. So they're coming that close at home. Well, I was actually there, uh, Quinton, as as we were texting, right? Yeah, and there was there was this kind of actually I I I, I turned to my left because Liz Liz was along for the ride yesterday. And I'm like, is it a perfect game or a no hitter? And she's like, just roll with it, man. Don't, don't worry about it. Just live it, live it. And I was like, okay, yeah. all right. I put my phone away. Right. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of a weird game because it was quite hot yesterday. And I had this feeling early on that this is not going to be a, like, it's not going to be a high scoring game. Cause we were baking like hams in the, uh, the outfield district behind the, uh, the bullpen there. Were you in the sunshine? Oh yeah, sunshine for most of the game, and then this like nice, cool shade kind of showed up. But um, but yeah, I get the story of the game was definitely Bowden Francis, and I I actually had a friend who was had promised me yeah I'll, I'll meet up with you, but then he, I got this text saying uh, we don't want to jinx the no no, so I'm gonna stay in the 500s. I'll you know I'll catch you another time kind of thing. Right? A, lot of, a lot of superstition evolves when it gets oh, yeah. down in the game and the no hitters going like, what do you say? What do you don't say? And like. <laughs> Well, and and actually, I think you po pointed out to me over text a, a, an an interesting kind of point, and, and maybe something that points maybe to his style of pitching because he had eight innings pitched, one hit, one earned run. So we know Francisco Lindor broke up that uh, no hitter. Tw his both his no hitters have been broken up by home runs in the yeah um, it was zero outs in the ninth the, inning. Yeah, top of the top of the ninth and. He only had one strikeout, though. Uh, Nathan Lucas was busy in right field in front of us, but he only had one strikeout uh, yesterday. Yeah, and some good defense, specifically Schneider. Like that, like uh, imagine he actually completed no hitter. That that play Schneider made that that's huge. Well, there's always one of those in like a no hit bid. You got to you got to have that one play where someone you got to make big, big play or, or a little bit of luck or there's always something like that plays a factor. Exactly. Man, so close. I mean, I mean, Brown Francis, I mean, he's not, you know, a, a lights out strikeout guy, but he is he does throw a fair bit. So that is surprising to see that he's he's doing it sort of on 
on fly balls and ground balls and letting the defense uh, back them up. Yeah, that's good to see because, you know, that kind of pitching is is worth its weight in gold. That's the kind of pitching that lasts a long time, I think, you know. Well, since July, so July 29th is when he kind of started to rack up some innings. And actually yesterday would have been his lowest strikeout count. So he, other than that, his first game, he had uh, two strikeouts, but then seven, eight, seven, 12, five, six, and one. So, you know, he's kind of, he's not obviously not Kevin Gosman, right? right. He's, he's not going to really do that. But uh, I, I thought, I, I definitely thought that was an interesting point. Also something that he, I guess is, kind of thing, his thing is like he does give up home runs so yeah. in those starts two yeah. one 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 zero two one so he's kind of he's he kind of gives he does give up home runs that's that's something but the only thing i have about bowden francis i and i'm not sure how much i want to compare this year to last year but last year he finished quite strong too and then the first part of the season did w- whatever did not translate so uh so well and hopefully he's figured something out this year with with pete walker and company but uh you know i he, he's been something to watch on this blue jays team aside of you know one other particular individual but i think he's been a highlight you know as you said dustin since the all-star break i mean you might be right that you know some history kind of Uh, can come back and we can, you know, I don't think we're going to see this moving forward, you know, this performance moving forward for the rest of his career, even into next year. But even if he can come back to 80% of this or what he's been in his last four games, and that's serviceable two, three kind of starter, um, along with Gosman and Barrios, um, that's, those are, those are good top three as any in the league. I think uh, if he can maintain what he's doing. Or even a, a four or five next year, like behind Barrios, Bassett, and Gosman, like just to have a solid like four or five, like that's yeah crosses one thing off the list, right? In terms of like off season shopping, yeah, because you got mean, holes to fill next year. <laughs> there's a lot to fill, yeah. especially on the on the bullpen side of things, for sure. All right, another player, of course, that all of the eyeballs have been on, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Dustin. Earlier in the year, I think we were talking pre All Star game, and we were kind of kind of musing if Vladdy didn't get voted into the All Star game, kind of who would the Jays, who would their All Star be, right? Because he at the time Vladdy won the popularity contest, right? And we were kind of musing about what other players would uh, would get there, but Vladdy's definitely uh, he he's definitely justified his All Star pick. Uh, the last. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to say really since the beginning of June. I mean, since the all-star break, he's been essentially the best to, uh, player in the league. I mean, by any kind of metric that you want to uh, look at, you know, at least the objective ones. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's great to see. He's definitely sort of improved on his uh, contract negotiation leverage, so to speak. I mean, we had t- been talking around the all-star break about you know well you know we still got to sign him but you know the conversation was a little bit more maybe on the blue jay side of things in terms of the the advantage towards you know what that numbers and end up what that number is going to end up being um and now you know i mean if it if it was uh my decision i'd give him you know whatever he wants i mean this is, you know, he's, if you think about it, he's younger than, you know, a lot of these quote unquote young guys that have been coming up in the, in recent days, right? He's younger than uh, Ernie Clement. He's younger than, you know, Will uh, Wagner. He's younger than a lot of these kids that we kind of think of as, as, as rookies, as young guys. So he's just entering his prime and, if he can, I guess the big question will be, can he do this, what he's been doing since the All-Star break, for a full season? Can he get out of a spring training and be you know, at this level? Um, that's the big question. I think he can. I think he's kind of earned that sort of benefit of the doubt. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting sort of off-season to see if we can 
lock him up this this off season. Yeah, he he hasn't been consistent. If you go back to 2019, like he's never until now, he hasn't really compared to what he did in 2021. So he's had his ups and downs, but he's been consistent as, in terms of being on the field. Like he hasn't spent much time on the injured list, like almost none that I can think of. So in terms like that gives him value. I can compare him to Bichette. Bichette has has his issues with injuries and like not being on the field, but uh, Vladdy, he's he's been there, right? So that that gives him value. I probably, in some ways, been proven will be proven wrong because Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was always going to want the money that the Jays are going to have to now pay him. If you look at the first baseman, kind of the last five to six years, like first basemen don't make the same amount of money that they used to it's it's you know shortstops and center fielders and is he gonna get paid like a third base or first man because he's got that ability right he's got that um in his resume so and and i think i you know another another discussion for this for this off season right and uh you know i i kind of mused like oh i don't you know i don't know if he's as good as freddie freeman and you know uh, matt olson if the jays are gonna sign this guy it, it's a blank check really, you know, at this point and the way this franchise is, is being run. That's the only thing that's going to get that, that signature on that contract. Yeah. We as the face of the franchise, like regardless of his performance, if he's inconsistent, like he's the face of the franchise, right? He puts, he puts people in the seats, he sells tickets and Rogers, like after the re- renovations and the money they put into the stadium, they, they want to sell tickets. They want to compete, but they need Vladdy like to, to maintain like the, interest i would think yeah i mean just for that he's worth you know paying him um you know the 300 or whatever million that that people are talking about you know is going to be the ballpark of what he's going to you know um get it is an interesting question about you know the third base i mean he knows the position he's done it somewhat but you know it seems like at least you know, from what I hear and what people are saying that, you know, he's, you know, it's not likely to be, you know, as good kind of defensively at third as he would be at first. But then we're looking at someone like Spencer Horowitz, who has come up, who is also kind of looking at landing at that first base position. You know, there's, he's played second base, Spencer has, but you know, he's been slugging a lot and he's kind of looking like a first baseman as well. So that's an interesting question is like, how does that all shake out? Does, does Vladdy stick at third? Can we kind of sacrifice some defense for getting Spencer Horowitz at first? And then, you know, also, you know, going out and getting a big slugger for the DH spot or something like that. Or do we put one of those two in the DH spot? Like, that's an interesting kind of conundrum. I think that'll shake out this off season because um, that that first base spot is is a little bit crowded with those two, especially with the performance that Spencer's been doing as well. Yeah, all, all good problems to have. Like, you got a guy who can play two positions, but I don't think Vladdy wants to be a DH. He's a guy who wants to play and play the field and be a part of the game offensively and defensively. Yeah, if you had to put one guy at first base, I'd put Vladdy there. It's just, you know. Yeah, he's a good first baseman. Like, he's played the position well. He really transitioned well, like, over the last couple of years. So he's definitely great over there. And once the season o- season's over, we can maybe put together, put all our heads together and fi- try to figure out, you know, if uh, if we were elevated to that GM level, what would we do? Honestly, I know it's a crowded position, but Spencer Horowitz at second is, I know he hasn't played there a lot, but I'd be okay with that, right? You know, if you can get someone at third, right? But um, that makes a lot of sense, you know, to have him at second. But I think recently um, John Schneider was saying, like, they're thinking of Spencer as a first baseman, which is a little bit weird. I mean, to me, I think the the conversation was Spencer's not going to, like, hit well enough to be a first baseman right and so the the kind of player that he was projected to to be was better at second base i mean you know a good defensive and and some contact but recently over the last few games the last few weeks here he's what hit like 16 home runs this year and he's just found some power and now he looks more like a first baseman so 
it is an interesting conundrum. It'll be a, a a puzzle that they'll have to solve. Maybe a trade will be in the works from the, <laughs> for that. Well, I kind of thought Spencer Horowitz as a Vladi insurance policy, to be honest, right? Um, you know, we talked about Leo Jimenez. You know, is is he gonna, you know, basically rep- eventually replace Bo? But I kind of thought Spencer Horowitz is like, well, you know, if, if we don't sign Vladdy, then we can just kind of slot him in there. Yeah, definitely rich in assets now after the trade deadline. There's a lot of uh, a lot of players, a lot of like guys that fill positions. So maybe trade bait, like you know. So the Jays are in a good position in uh, that respect. So that's a positive thing moving forward. Speaking about our our shortstop, uh, he had some comments this week, and I, I'm not going to mention them all, but I'm I'm going to mention one in particular, and I will volley this over to you guys for some thoughts. Uh, so Bo Bichette uh, mentioned, I don't know, if it looked like it was an interview with somebody. I was reading articles, so I don't know who it was with. But when I had time to think about what I want, basically my ultimate goal really is to play with Vladdy forever, to win a championship with him, and to do that with this organization. Gentlemen, your thoughts. So I don't know if he's taking a step back from his previous comments, being open to a trade, or he's just, you know, elaborating more. I could I'd be open to a trade, but my ultimate goal is to stay in this city and play with Vladdy. But I guess like who wouldn't, right? Like Vladdy's just he's a superstar. So I tend to be a little bit cynical about these things. I mean, I, I have no doubt that, you know, there's he loves Vladdy. They came up together. They seem, when you see them together, they're good friends. And there's no doubt that, you know, he would, if he had, you know, if that dream that he's talking about of winning a, a championship with Toronto, with Vladdy, you know, he would love that. The other side of me says, the, the cynical side of me says that, He's just trying to shut down the conversation that's been happening over the last few weeks uh, about his attitude and how he doesn't like it here in Toronto. He's just trying to say, look, I don't, he just wants to put something out there that ends that conversation so that he doesn't have to hear it. He doesn't have to, you know, it's, it's a PR move, right? Because he knows that it doesn't matter whether he said that or not. If he's going to be here is going to depend on how much money they're willing to, to, you know, put on paper and put him in front of him to sign. So has his value diminished, would you think? Like the time on the injured list? Like in terms of like if they were like to try to like uh, extend his contract in the off season, like would it be diminished at this point or would he no. and his agent feel the same way? I don't think no. Like trade wise, I think I think trade wise it's demi- uh, he you will get less for Boba Shed right now than a healthy Boba Shed. But I still think he's gonna want his same yeah, but but in terms of an extension, five, six, ten years. In terms of what the contract that he'll sign next, no. What what I think is likely going to happen is they'll hear some trade offers this off season. Unless it's like blown out of the water, he'll start with the Blue Jays um, next year, twenty five, and then trade deadline. Uh, if the Blue Jays aren't in it, and he'll uh, end out the career, end out his time here, you know, with the Blue Jays, if um, if we're looking like we're in a playoff spot or something like that. So that's I, I, at first I thought that they might trade him this off season, but I feel like that's unlikely now. Like Al said, his trade value is a little bit lower. They're not nobody's going to blow the Blue Jays out of the water, uh, you know, f- to make it worth you know, not keeping him around and, and having him on our roster for competing next year. It would be unfortunate though, like to let it, let his contract play out and not get anything back in the trade and have him walk would be, it'd be sad, but. Well, I'm going to give you my thoughts on this. So I do think it's bullshit, Dustin. <laughs> I think it's total PR stunt, but I also want Boba Shed to grow the fuck up. All right. If you want the contract that you desire, you're not playing with Vladdy your whole career. In fact, it's very likely you will never play with him again. You will only play with him on the Blue Jays for the next year. And that's it, right? That like I you know, I want to go to school with Dustin and be friends and and you know, live down the street from him forever. Sorry, man. <laughs> we we things grow up and I get like he's in his 20s, so like, you know, I should maybe 
you know, dial this one back a bit, but like, what you want to play? I get you. You come through the system with Vladdy. I, I totally get it. I understand it. But like, it it just I don't know. I it just sounds like someone extremely immature to me. And you know, yes, trying to change the um, trying to change the conversation. But I think you could have done it a little bit differently, right? I put money on the fact that after his Blue Jays time, unless it's like a late career. They somehow cross paths. They're never playing together on the same team again. Well, unless the Blue Jays sign both of them. Well, I don't think they're doing that either. I think that that's up to Rogers. Come on, we can dream, right? Nope. <laughs> Why not? Well, we can dream, and that's exactly what it's going to be, right? And I think, you know, we've talked about in the past who are we going to sign, and you know, over the past since since this podcast has has been an inception, it started off as. Sign Boba Shett, sign Boba Shett, right? Because Vladdy was kind of had his his ups and downs. And then in the last six months, that conversation has switched, right? Absolutely. It's signed Vladdy, right? Signed everyone wants to sign Vladdy now. And frankly, this team is going to have to sign Vladdy, right? They they just have to. I and and if they don't, I think it's going to be it's gonna be another like unless they unless they somehow pull a rabbit out of a hat, it's gonna be another failing off season. Um, but I don't know. Boba Shed is like, you know, he's a great player, but like, I need, you know, I need to see, I need to see some more from him. And you know what? Yes, he will. If the Jays are not in it, he's being traded next trade deadline. 100%. But the thing is, if they trade Bo, like to say in the off season, like they got to replace him because they, they've made it clear they want to compete next year. You have to have a shortstop, at least somewhat comparable. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to trade in the off season. It's, it's, it's kind of like, trading an asset at its lowest point, even though I think Bo has a lot of value. I think he's a great player, but I just don't think you, what you're going to get is you're going to get teams doing flybys and seeing if they, they lame duck president and whoever's the general manager it will maybe take, maybe take a, a little, they'll be dropping a little, little hint, little bait to see if they pick it up yeah, and making low ball offers. Yeah. It'll be lower ball or maybe like, little like little to get their interest you're not it's not going to be the haul that they got kind of like the yusa kikuchi deal right yeah like that was like they they really they ross hackins really did well on that i don't think i don't think we're going to come away like wow he really got a haul for Bo in the off season and what's going to happen because of that they'll just keep him he's a he's a shortstop though he's a, he's a good shortstop and shortstops that are premium and he did lead the american league in, in uh hits two years so that's he still has that potential you can't take that away from him so who knows like yeah i mean the maximum value you could have got for him was if he was help healthy this um this trade deadline and he wasn't or if he was hitting before he got hurt which he's had an off down yeah. season yeah to, that's to boot too. so and so the next sort of most leverage that you'll have the the highest value that you'll have for him is if he starts next year he's healthy and he's hitting and he's good at the next trade deadline and the Blue Jays are not, you know, looking to sell. That's that's the next point. Like this offseason, like I said, and like I'll said, like you're going to get some, you're going to get offers and you're going to listen. But the only way Bo, Bo's getting traded is if it's like, you know, a blowout, you know, can't say no offer. Yeah, so someone's got to knock their socks off with a deal. Exactly. All right, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with more Blue Jays blunders. All right, we are back. Blue Jays, Mets. Uh, we're going to talk about game number one, Dustin. And I, I sent you guys a link. Uh, Caleb Joseph went off after the game and rightfully so this is the toronto blue jays and you know what i i i actually listened to it again and i actually think it's maybe not just the jays i think this is a again another baseball problem but basically the jays trying to the the bigger pitcher you know they're always trying to like you know big numbers and over the course of a season you know this is this this is this is we're playing the percentages except they the problem with this team is they do not do the small things correctly, right? They've never done the small things correctly and they, they, and, and they won't win because they don't do the small things correctly. And I will set the scene, right? So 
the bottom of the seventh, the Jays take the lead two to one in that game. Okay. Alejandro Kirk puts a nice swing on a ball, hits it to right field, gets on base. And as it's late in the game, Alejandro Kirk, our little man, <laughs> Alejandro Kirk, he is not at the fleetest of foot. So he gets pinch, uh, a pinch runner for Brian Servin. Brian Servin ends up coming in to score that second run. So the Jays go into the top of the eighth, up two to one, you know, really great spot, poised to win the game. The top of that eighth inning is a walk, a single and a walk. So no outs, okay, bases loaded, all right? The Jays bring in a pitcher who throws a ton of curveballs, okay? So, you know, might miss a few of those, might end up in the dirt. And Caleb Joseph's beef, right, is that Brian Servin is being instructed to do the, um, I guess, the one knee crouch. It's like not the cr- traditional catcher, like th- the traditional catcher's crouch, but he's kind of... Before, b- before you move on, he's being instructed by who? You think he was told in that moment, this is how you, you crouch? So Caleb Joseph basically said because he's he played in the big leagues he said this is how they're instructing you now and and i'll tell you yes, why generally but he wasn't told in that moment to do that no okay. but this is exactly the problem basically when you do this you are more likely to get a strike call you know framing whatever all that right except there's guys on base and when you're in this position you are not as able to block balls you are not as able to, you're, you're not as defensively as good of a catcher. Can't, is, you can't move so, laterally left or right. You cannot yeah. move laterally, right? It, this, is, this is for framing, right? And basically, Caleb Joseph go, basically says that you can do this, but not with the pitcher that you have on the mound and not with, with basically the bases loaded. Listen, Alejandro Kirk does this all the time. All, all the time. The problem Everybody is, is that... The, what's that? Everybody does. The, Everybody the does it. And, and so maybe this is a baseball problem and not a Blue Jays problem, as, as I kind of touched off the top. But when you have this situation, right, with the pitcher on the mound and zero outs and the base is loaded, like, I don't think this is the right time to be doing this, right? And what happens? There's a wild pitch and a pass ball and the Blue Jays lose that game, right? And in both situations, he, he, he's in his one you know, his one knee stance or whatever. And he just misses, he misses the ball. Right. I, I don't, I'm, I'm do not think this would have happened if he's, he's in a traditional catcher's, you know, yeah. crouch. He could have moved over and blocked it and kept it in front of him. And that way the runners don't advance. That's probably what happened. Yeah. I mean, I mean, generally I agree with Caleb. I agree with you. Those videos looked horrible. He's got his leg like he's doing, he's one on one foot, and then his other f- leg is like stretched out to the left, and he's trying to catch the ball, and 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 get a strike. I mean, of course, you're not going to be able to block a ball in that position. But my, I guess my where I would disagree is that this is some sort of like um, analytics failing. I think this is a failing of coaching. So the analytics department is right. Where you, where your glove starts as a catcher and then where it ends up, if that's if there's a small difference between that, essentially if the if the pitcher can like hit your glove, that looks more like a strike to a, an umpire than if your glove moves a, a lot of a, a long distance, right? So they get low to get their glove lower so that they can catch that curveball, you know where it kind of is going to end up, and you know th- those end up getting you more strikes in the long run over the course of, you know, whatever, however many pitches. But you're right, too. I mean, like, in you, you got to change that philosophy in a moment like bases loaded, nobody out in, you know, the last third of the game. I think it was the eighth inning, right? Like, yeah, you got to sort of sacrifice the strike call to save the out or save the run. Like, what's more valuable, the strike or the run, right? The risk outweighs the reward. It's an easy, it's an easy answer to this question. Does it, my issue isn't with the analytics, right? Like, if you told me that this way, you know, by doing this, you will get more strike calls, 
sure like that sounds about right to me the problem is again is like how this stuff is applied right you know over the course of 162 games fine right that that makes sense to me that that this this is the the likely outcome but in the moment you have to be able to adjust right like this is yeah. baseball right and this is like Caleb Joseph said if this was the if this was a playoff game you would have lost a playoff game because of this you need to be able to do and this is you know what what's the one thing September's for right showing off you know we're obviously showing off young players seeing how they do but you know what I want to see I want to see that this team can actually play good baseball right Smart like baseball. this is practice right essentially you're practicing to show me that you can do this next year like not me but like the collective fan base right and this team has at every opportunity same case so the Barrios thing last year was it wasn't about like everybody knows that the third time through the order you know the pitcher's not not as successful right and you know what and and it doesn't take a, a very knowledgeable blue jays fan to, to know that Barrios isn't the greatest against lefties, right? But like you have to like in the moment, you have to in the moment be able to like take that information and say, you know what? Brian Servan, like, like, and you know what? I don't know what it takes. Like, I'm sure there's a like some kind of signal. I'm like, they they talk back and forth all the time between the dugout and him, you know. And this is he he's obviously being I think he's being coached the way this Caleb Joseph confirmed that this is the way that they, they coach guys now because of this more likelihood of a strike and you do have to be able to adjust and this team just can't, they just can't. And, and until they do these small things, they, this team is not winning anything, anything. Here's what we don't know. And because we're blue Jays fans is we don't know if this is a blue Jays problem or it, well, it's absolutely a league problem. Everybody, every catcher mm-hmm. catches like this for sure. But I'd be interested to know: Are there teams that do make that adjustment in, you know, close and late bases loaded situations? Do ca- are there catchers that you know go to a different stance that are that become more sensitive to the pass ball, um, et cetera, or? You know, is it just like, you know, you're just taking the gamble and hoping? Well, it, but there's a lot of variables, right? So it has, it really, the, the, probably the thing that matters the most, obviously the situation, but also the pitcher, right? Like if you have a guy who's basically throwing like changeups, fastballs and, and sliders, like probably, you know, you probably don't need that. Now, if you have a guy throwing splitters and stuff that like really dives, I, I would think maybe. Maybe you want maybe you want to make an adjustment. Yeah, you want to, but do they? That's that's the question. I I don't know. Well, hard for us to know as fans, but yeah. Here here's an interesting angle. Is like I know that in the in the minors they're do they're having the um what's it called the robot umps. robot umps now. Yeah, is that gonna like kind of make this whole and... conversation moot? Like, do do catchers just then go back to the more traditional stances because i would think you know, so because because a strike's gonna be a strike no matter what a ball is right. a ball it's there's no no more gray area well there's no more tricking the ump so fr- framing framing the pitch becomes irrelevant now because if it's a strike it'll be called a strike right we get and you know what we won't be able to talk about alejandro kirk and his framing abilities <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's it I mean, those kinds of guys will become less valuable right mm-hmm. do, do you see that like uh taken off in the major leagues in the near future I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm a traditionalist. I don't like I don't like challenges. I don't like any of that. Like, so there's two methods that they're testing right now in the minor leagues. There's like the straight, like just robot ump, where the ump's there, but he's hearing you know strike ball, and then he just makes the call whatever he hears. That's the one way, and the other way is the ump's making a call as he sees it as he normally would. But then there's the like the tap. The the batter can tap their helmet, and then. That's like a the challenge. batter, or the pitcher, the batter or the pitcher can can basically challenge whether or not the, the call was correct, and then there's like a a robot that will tell the the ump. So I like that one. I think that's kind of the happy medium where you know basically the whole point of challenges and all that stuff is just let's get the call right. Um, 
I mean, I can see the the argument from traditional kind of like it's human error and like we just accept yeah, it. It's, it's part it of the game. It averages out all totally. the, you know, and that's fine. But I think there's also kind of, I, I do kind of err on the side of let's get the call right as long as it doesn't like slow down the game or, or you know, make it, you know, just not, not the game that we're used to. And so I think the challenge is, is, is reasonable. It's like everything's normal until you know the ball there's because there's some egregious strike calls or ball calls that you know i've seen this year that just you know it makes me sick <laughs> I, you know i can't stand you know a ball down the middle called a you know a ball or a strike down the middle rather called a ball um you know it's just you know so uh, i'd like to see it but We'll see. I don't know if it's going to come in or not. What, what level of um, the minors is that being uh, used in now? Is it? It's not AAA, is it, is it? Yeah. AAA too? That that high? Oh, wow. So it's... And there's there's been some talk about a lot of the kids coming up, you know, that like they're struggling a little bit to get used to the difference, right? Because they're used to like a very strict strike zone called by a robot and then they're coming into the majors and the, there's these and they got some, angel hernandez <laughs> yeah, like, yeah you know, the, waving his dick around just doing whatever well like i said i'm a traditionalist i, I i'm even the challenges i like you know like the calls on the bases like just being called as they are in the field i know sometimes it can be egregious and like it makes you angry as fans if like your if your team gets the wrong call but like it's like like uh, Dustin said, it goes both ways and it kind of like uh, averages out in the long run, right? Just just the, the delays, like you know, what I mean, the, the the game loses its flow with uh, the challenges and things like that. And I don't know there's there's something that'll be lost if uh, Robo Umps take over the uh, the balls and strikes. It just uh, this wouldn't be the same game to me. Well, Robo Umps is a dirty word on this podcast, so I'm not. <laughs> At least in my opinion, I I I am a traditionalist as well. Challenge system, yeah, you could probably sell me on. Um, yeah. It's I, not on everything, I, right? The thing is, is that like how how correct? Like if it's a half a millimeter, like like half a millimeter, like I don't know, like a, or, or do we really need to be this exact, right? Like I and and I do think like the spirit of some of it is lost right and i and i know um i think i think well umps definitely did things a lot differently you know decades ago right because they could kind of they seem like they could use their strike zone as like a way to kind of control the game a little bit right if someone was getting a little kind of uppity like they could the like that was their way of kind of of dealing with things and um but i i just want better you know if we could find a way just to have better umpires and you know what i don't know I, i think Yes, there's some egregious calls, Dustin, but I feel like, I don't know, I feel like there's the balls and strikes are still better than it than it was. I don't know. I might, I yeah, might be probably. off base on that, but yeah, and I'll, I'll agree. I think I, I would prefer, if anything, the challenge system. It's sort of it maintains some level of, you know, consistency and traditional way of doing things, but also gives the opportunity for those egregious calls to be at least, you know, checked. And it's also to to some degree um like accountability for the umpire. Right? So those umpires that are shit, you know, they yeah. get challenged more than others, they're going to get called out of, for it. And yeah. It's exposed and it's, for it's, it's obvious, it's right? And, yeah. So wouldn't you wouldn't you miss though the like if robot umpires became a thing in the majors like losing the interaction between the umpire and the the batter like challenging a strike call and catcher the pitcher like imagine losing that part of the game I couldn't imagine because it, it's such like a they'll never part not of the be game an now. umpire back there right it'll be the robot telling the umpire what to call oh right. But then you can't really argue with the ump because the ump's being told what the strike is. So you can't, there's no point. Like, he's just the messenger. You're not supposed to ump uh, uh, argue balls and strikes, anyways, right? That's like one of the big no nos, right? That gets you tossed. Yeah. (laughs) But you're right. I mean, that is some of the more interesting kind of clips that you see is, 
guys getting mad at the umps and them yeah, or just back you know, not, not, not even arguing, just saying, oh, I thought that one was high. You know what I mean? Like, okay, if you say so, like you know, just kind of establishing, I don't agree with you. It doesn't have to be an argument, but to eliminate that from the game, it would be a little bit, a whole different game. Like, would George Springer be less mad or more mad with Robo Umps? Because I think I feel like he's less, been screwed over right? a bunch this season. Like, even like I, I don't think I've ever seen him so upset at times. And you know what? Most of the time, it's like rightfully so because something like some there's been a call miss. And I wonder, I wonder how he, like kind of how differently this season would have kind of gone for him in terms of his interaction with the Umps uh, if if there was Robo Umps. Yeah. Well, and there are players that are also, you know, always arguing when they shouldn't be. And those two will get checked, right? When they challenge something and the umpire says, no, I was right. And they're like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, so there's going to be that too. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I, I mean, if you look at if you look at tennis, what they've done, they've eliminated the line judges on most yeah. tour- tournaments. And like, it's, there's something missing now when I watch like a tennis match because... It's it's clear cut. The ball is in and out. Like so, you don't have that. The like, ho- what, Hawkeye? <laughs> what is it? Hawkeye? I think. Yeah. Yeah, equal Hawkeye. Yeah. So it's it's down to like a hair of the ball was in or out. So like it's. Well, I can so different sport, but a few years ago, a team in England didn't win a title because the ball was, tw- I think it was twelve millimeters. It was still on the line by twelve millimeters, and they they and. They use goal line technology, which I think is like a derivative of Hawkeye. And so like most of the ball's over, but the little little bit Yeah, it's gotta be completely over. Would have been a goal. Just like a ago. just like a puck. It's gotta be space between the line and the ball. Exactly. All right. We had a little I don't know if it was an update this week, but we had uh and it was it was pretty quiet. I didn't quite catch this until uh it was mentioned to me at the game yesterday. Uh but Bob Nightingale, Dustin's favorite of USA Today, uh, had a little, he had a little footnote on his, I guess, his weekly article, and he mentioned the Toronto Blue Jays could possibly shift GM Ross Atkins to a different role after failing to make the playoffs, but there's no indication that he will be dismissed. I didn't see that one. So it, this is, there, there's literally nothing more to add. This is, it was a literally footnote in his, like it was kind of the notes at the end of his, his article. Uh, gentlemen, can I get your thoughts? Would this be a demotion or like a lateral move? Like, is there? I'm starting to think Bob Nightingale, like, you know, gets messages in his dreams, and that's what he reports. I I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he also reported that you know Bo Bichette was uh, not liking it here in in Blue Jays land, and now Bo comes out. Now I I know we we kind of don't believe Bo all that you know is a hundred percent honest, but I don't know. I don't know. That's, I mean, I guess that's uh, is a reasonable guess. It it just seems to me that what Bob does is he kind of makes educated guesses and hopes that he's right. Because I think what he's thinking is like Ross Atkins and Shapiro are friends. Shapiro's not going to want to fire him like unceremoniously, um, and so it does maybe make some sense that that would happen. Is that they, yeah give him some kind of you know new new position yeah you know i don't know what they would call it some make up some title you know uh but and then and put somebody else in and it, it's kind of best of both worlds you, you sort of satisfy those fans that want to see ross out of the gm job but you're also not throwing him to the wind because i don't know if ross would get another job somewhere else well, these guys have what one year left in their contract? Shapiro and Atkins, like, is it just Shapiro next year has or? one, so. Atkins has two. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So Shapiro's deal ends with Vladdy. My my opinion is Shapiro's it, that he'll sign another five year deal. Like, it, he'll be here until he doesn't want to be here. Like, I I think that he's the guy that the board wants. So so if the Jays like they're unsuccessful again next year there's still a job on the table for him you predict for Shapiro for Shapiro yeah yeah because his job isn't successful Blue Jays team his job is make money for for the Rogers and that's what he's done I mean with with these the renovations I mean 
more financial than wins and losses. That's why it's it's more it's more, even more important to sign Vladdy because you don't sign Vladdy, you're not going to make that same revenue. Well, yeah, absolutely. You, you think? Right. Yeah, you're right. Quinn, you have any thoughts on this Ross Atkins thing? What like you? you I I think judging by our our text trades, you would prefer that he be shit canned. Um. Well, you look at his tenure thus far. Like they've been in the playoffs, but it's not as hard as it used to be with expanded wall card format. They've snuck in the last couple of years, so it's not like they've won a division. So based on success, like he's got to show more. I think this coming year they got to fill the holes and they got to get back in the playoffs and win a playoff game. That to, nice. to start. <laughs> And build on that, but if it's more of what we've seen this year, you got to fill the holes with something more than you know, kind of Falefas or Vogelbacks and you know, Justin Turner's. There's got to be more to to complement the cast, right? Because Vladdy and Bo, they don't like they they have their ups and downs, or they go in their slumps, and you have to have consistent hitters. So they got to find a way to you know, fill the holes and get their uh, you know 90, 90 plus wins and get back in the playoffs and find success and if not i don't know i don't know if he should have a position moving forward al do you think he should be there for 2020 okay so number one he should be he should be shit canned all right right now uh, like at end of season well i would have fired first. him in june to be honest but you know that that obviously didn't happen but i i think ross Atkins should be fired and all right if mark shapiro moves him if he if he does the the in between moves him out of the job he is a fucking coward right that's what he is right you either shit can him or you say nope this is the guy i'm sticking with right that's yeah, it you, you gotta make a statement like, move, this, is, this is unacceptable is total, this is how we're handling if it, this yeah. is if this is what he does it, it is a total cowardly move oh he's my friend and i don't want listen this is a businessman and also why okay so if, if i agree shapiro could basically write his own contract why why is he going into the last year of his deal right what what is, how is this how is this not tied up like so you have we have we have guys that we want to sign bo and vadi and nobody knows nobody knows who the the president could be in two years if he doesn't sign and things go bad he could be uh, he could be walked out too right i i don't understand what's going on with this front office it's very very confusing and it makes no sense whatsoever I think I think you're reading too much into one year left on Shapiro. I, Shapiro's here until Shapiro wants to not be here. Yes. I can guarantee so does, you. So so why so if why so does he not want to be here beyond end of next year? No, he's still got one more year. I so, I mean so beyond twenty five, right? So he has a contract for one more year after right. this season. So when so that contract's if he, if, up, he signs another contract. Presidents don't aren't lame duck. That's that's a GM thing. You're thinking Shapiro's yes. a GM, right? He listen, presidents he are presidents. Player. Like think of a Paul Beeston. How many do you, do you, do you even remember how many times Paul Beeston's no. contract ran out and then he resigned? Was. Like who cared about that? Nobody cared about that. People people kind of think of Shapiro as like because they think of him kind of tied up with Ross Atkins because they came here together and everybody at the time thought, oh, Shapiro's going to be. He's going to be the puppet master, puppet, puppeteering Ross Atkins. And maybe he does. I don't know. But that, that still doesn't change the fact that his job, his job, the president's job, is to make sure that Rogers makes money. That's what he's mm -hmm. done. He's done that successfully his, the seven, nine years or whatever it's been since he's I, come I'm here. not saying, I'm not suggesting, like I, I'm okay with, with Mark's prior saying. In fact, I've been wanting him to be uncoupled from the Atkins product for a on while. the field. The the experience at the ballpark, just just the the jerseys, everything about the Blue Jays right now is better now than it was nine years ago or whatever it was when he when he signed um, when he came. Well, out. I don't know about that, but those, those, those are a couple of good years. Fifteen. Those 16. were a couple of good years, <laughs> yeah. buddy. Yeah, those are good times, right? But the experience at the ballpark is better, right? Yeah, it's a better ballpark. We've been consistently at the playoffs. Right, for the most part, yeah, it's not yeah. been great. So Twenty-four but, hours at a time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eliminated. But Fair enough. Good. The 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 jersey changes and and the so that kind of merch shit has been pretty good. So I mean, and the money and the Blue Jays are making money. The I think 
the real kind of like sticking point will be, like you said, you know, the signing of like um, Vladdy and Bo and like all that, like whether or not they kind of feel comfortable signing and that the, the people that they're signing with now are going to be the people that I'm dealing with, you know, 10 years from now. I mean, that, all that's got to kind of. Well, like, I, I no, I, I think that's a little unreasonable to say, like, but I think a player probably wants to know, like, three years, five years, like, yeah. like where is this team heading, right? Right, exactly. And the thing, with, the thing with Vladdy is, I think Vladdy would be totally fine playing on a losing team, making a lot of money. I Like, he likes to be, he's a big fish in the Toronto pond, right? And he's okay with that. Bo... Bo Bo wants Bo wants to get paid and he wants to win. So like he's he's likely off somewhere. But I think Vladdy's on the table. But Vladdy, you know, is now as long as you pay him, I think he'll be he'll be happy. But I just I there's a lot of questions, right? And if you're gonna say, well, you know what, Ross, we're just gonna move you over to vice president of player personnel instead of you know vice president of play of baseball operations, and we're gonna you know promote this guy like. I don't like, does it really change all that much? Right? Like I, we need, this team needs new ideas. It needs new methods of, of, of doing things. Right? Like it's just not working and keeping Ross Atkins around. Like he's probably, you're going to keep him around. And he's not going to have any influence. Like, come on. Well, it all depends on like, what his job is. They, yes. they make, what if they make him scouting director? Uh, well, that would be shit too, because he's has he's drafted. Well, like yeah, I know, I know, right? That's that's not good, right? But what if they make him? I don't know. Listen, don't know. if he what, what collects they, tickets, I'd be okay look, with that. We're we're, we're <laughs> talking it. about this like Bob Nightingale says correct shit. Like he says dumb shit all the time. I don't. I don't. Hey, he was the one that poo pooed the Shohei Otani thing last year. He was one of the first ones to go. Uh, uh-uh, this is not. This is not what's happening, right? He. I think he's reasonably well connected this this seems very vague and very general so i I thought it was a talking point we haven't podcasted in a while and i like to flog no it's fair enough to bring it up and talk about it obviously but i just i just think that you know it's like bob's having drinks with some you know nobody that he knows and they're just shooting the shit and like theorizing you know what could happen and it like makes some minor sense to him and then he reports does, does it does he even have a does he have a credible source even like, right like source be on the inside of the blue jays management front office like who knows well okay so we'll end this uh dustin ross atkins does he uh is he a blue jays employee in 2025 yeah unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah i think he is too and i'm gonna be upset but um I think that's uh, I think that's happening. One more crack at it. Yeah, exactly. One more crack. One more crack with the same shitty ideas, gentlemen. Uh, I think that is all the time we have. Dustin, um, you uh, plug our social media. Yeah, you can follow us on X at uh, S two S Pod, and uh, email us at Station Two Pod at Gmail dot com. Mm-hmm.